Amen. Okay. Good to have everybody with us tonight. If you are visiting, we're certainly glad to have you with us. And um, we're studying from a book called Excellence in Praise and Worship. And uh, we, for those that are members that uh, have, have, don't have a book, would you raise your hand? So one, two, some over here, over here, here. So Travis, just keep your hands up so Travis can see where you are if you need a book. And if you're visiting, we'd certainly be glad to give you a book to check out too while we're going through this tonight. Travis, I think we've got some visitors in here too. Anybody else over here and over there? It's good to have everybody with us tonight and uh, hope everybody's had an opportunity to look at the lesson. It is 1.6. What page is that on? Page 23. Page 23 in the book, lesson 1.6, and the lesson is coming to his presence with singing. We got everybody taken care of with the books. You're still on? Okay. All right, I've asked David if he would to uh, word our opening prayer as we get started, and then we'll... Let's bow. Our dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful to you that we can be here this evening. As we begin our study, Father, we pray that you look down on us in tender love and mercy and forgive us of any wrong that may there may be between us and you. We pray that you'll hear our prayers. We thank you, Father, for this evening and this place that we may come together to study your word and to uh, learn how to uh, better how to uh, praise you and and uh, for our worship uh, to be acceptable to you we are thankful father for your son jesus and for his sacrifice on our behalf we thank you for redemption we thank you for the truth that you've revealed to us through your word we thank you, uh, Father, that we can, that you will be our Father and we can be your children. We pray that you be with Jim tonight as he leads our study and leads our minds in the things he will discuss with us. And we pray that we can uh, take these things like uh, vitamins and uh, we pray that uh, they will uh, be beneficial to us and that we can improve our uh, worship of you. We uh, thank you, Father, for your creation and for everything that you have provided to us to uh, make our lives comfortable. And we are uh, thankful that we have this place to worship you and to study your word. We pray, Father, that you will bless our labor here at West End we pray that you'll be with us as shepherds, give us wisdom and discernment to lead your people. We pray, Father, that uh, you will be with our deacons as uh, they serve and be with each member as we, uh, as we work together in peace and love. And we pray that we'll be the kind of people you want us to be, that as uh, a church we'll be active and productive and effective in the kingdom and we pray that uh, everything we do will glorify you please uh, uh, bless those of our number who are ill uh, so many that we remember daily and and uh, go to you about father we pray that you will heal those who are ill we pray that you will uh, comfort those who are sorrow, who are suffering sorrow and grief, and uh, we pray, Father, you know, we know that you know us, you made us, you know what we need. We pray that you will provide uh, to us according to your will, and we pray that uh, we will accept uh, with grace the things that you give us. 
Uh, we uh, ask that you be with us, give us a safe journey home this evening as uh, after we're finished with our period of study and worship. We pray that we will leave here with, uh, uh, with hearts full of encouragement. We pray that it, when we leave here, Father, that we'll be encouraged to uh, uh, obey you and do whatever you want us to do to please you and to serve the purpose that you've set before each one of us. We pray all of these things in uh, the name of Christ Jesus. Uh, amen. Yeah. Okay, David, thanks. Um, hopefully the microphone will hold up here. It cut out me a couple of times before I even really got started, but... Uh, okay, want everybody to participate tonight, and as I ask questions, please do as you always do. Uh, sound off. Give me the answers. Excellence in praise and worship. Uh, like we said, we're talking tonight about singing. So if you remember on Sunday morning, what we talked about was Thanksgiving, all the things that we have to be thankful for and how that is manifest in our lives and the things that we do and say and the responsibility that we've got for who we are and what we are, and we're going to continue some of those kinds of thoughts tonight, but I'm going to hit you with this question to start with, if it'll change. I mashed the right button. I know I did. It's the one with the arrow in the middle. There it is. Okay, so first question to you is, and this is a very individual question, what does God think about my singing? I want you to just ponder on that for a minute. I want you to think about how you sing. What does God think about my singing? And then the second question I want to ask is what does God think about the singing at West End? And I'm not asking for anybody to answer either one of those questions, right? But we're going to get into it in, uh, in just a few minutes about some of that stuff we're individually. But, you know, the other thing that I would ask you to ask yourself, and you can answer this one if you want to, when, when we talk about what does God think about my singing, when I ask myself that question, how do I evaluate myself individually on that? So I take a little bit of honest introspection. So how do you go about writing yourself with regard to your singing? John? Well, to be honest, some of it's kind of like horny. <laughs> <laughs> John said... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Put all the horses together. So everybody sounds different. We're going to talk about ability and all that stuff. But how do we evaluate ourselves individually? How do I go about evaluating my singing? Bill? It is what's in our hearts. It is what's in our hearts. I mean, that's where it all starts. But again, I'm going to ask a few questions here a little bit later with regard to our singing and how we do. Take your Bibles, if you don't mind, open them up. And the, um, the main uh, scriptures for this lesson is Psalms 100 and verses 1 through 5. And it says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Make a joyful shout unto the Lord. A lot of psalms you know, really focus on singing and psalms are you know there's 150 of them they're poems they're songs uh, various authors David wrote about probably wrote more than half of them 
but 75 of them are specifically attributed to them from what I found and have studied previously. They said 50, none, no author. But again, I think more of them were probably attributed to him than the 75. But in many of those psalms, well, the things that we see are the messianic prophecies that are tied to the psalms. And they, they show the connection between the deity of Christ and the fulfillment of the promise that was made. Psalms 2 and 7. In Acts 13, Paul uh, talks about the promise. In the next one, in Psalms 8 and 6, uh, and ties to Hebrews, the second chapter, in verses 6 through 10, talks about the superiority of Christ. In Psalms 41 and 9, it ties to Hebrews 1 and 8, talking about the Godhead of Christ, and also in Psalms 110 and 1, um, ties to Matthew 22, 44, and again, talking about Godhead, God in the flesh, the power of God, the relationship between God and Christ. And so when we, when we think about all of those things uh, that are, are tied together in the Psalms, in the songs that it says that we should sing praise to God, but it also ties Christ together with the fulfillment of the prophecy of him being who he was and doing what he was going to do with regard to our salvation. One of the things that was pointed out in the book uh, that you might want to take a look at, and I think it's on that first page there, is with regard to the definition of joyful noise. And it's ruah, it's a Hebrew word. And it is, the definition says, a shout or noise made for joy. Also, it's meant as a noise for victory, as it was talked about in, uh, in, in Joshua 6, where the walls of Jericho were brought, was, were brought down. But it also talks about the celebration, that every song that we sing should be a celebration of worship to God. Now stop and think about that for just a minute. Every song we sing should be a celebration to God and His power and His authority. And again, go back and think about the last song you sang and did it sound like a celebration to God? To Bill's point, was your heart where it needed to be with regard to putting the energy into that song that you needed to from your heart in thinking about the words that were being said in making sure that we were doing the best we could to praise God in the way that we sang. One of the other things that we can think about as it relates to the definition is that our singing should reflect the victory that we have through the blood of Christ and the hope that we have of eternal life because of the sacrifice that was made for us, because of the gift that we've been given through the blood of Christ. And as we think about those things and we think about, is our voice that way? Is it a joyful noise? Is our heart that way? Are we reflecting on our thankfulness and the blessings that we have, or are we just singing the words, we know the tune, and we've really not given it much thought? Y'all ever find yourself in that position? LR? I don't know. Okay, hang on a second. Let's, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll let Matt get down here and get the microphone. So you don't know music? I don't, except for band music from high school. Okay. So for me, sometimes the directions are given, I have no clue what they're doing. And I get frustrated. And I don't know the music up there when I see the music other than my experience in high school band. Right. And so when I'm learning a song, it's by rote. It's by us singing it over and over, and then I'm figuring it out. Right. And I get frustrated because I'm like, I know I'm not singing it right, and I get frustrated, and then my mind's going to the mechanics instead of, do the best you can, praise God. And that's an internal issue that I've, I have because uh, sometimes I have that issue with the mechanics. I don't understand them. Yeah, and again, I mean, how many people in here really know all there is to know about, about music? I mean, you think we've got a whole bunch of music scholars in here? Uh, I'm not, and I'm a song leader. I guess I'm what you call a sight song a sight reader with regard to music, but I can kind of pick things out. But you know what I do? 
I practice and I practice and I practice <laughs> and I practice and we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But at the end of the day, God knows your heart and you're going to do the best that you can. But I think, LR, you've made a good point. We've got to make sure that it's not rote. We do have to understand how the song sounds and wanting to be able to follow along with the song the way that it was written. But, but we, what we don't want to do is we don't want to lose sight of what we're singing for and about. And that is for thanksgiving, and that is for joy, and that is for the blessings that we have through the sacrifice that has been made for us. Anybody else got a comment on that with regard to? Come on. Okay. The only way I can sing is if this note that's next is higher than the one I had, <laughs> then I got to go up. Right. And if it's out of this, uh, out of this other book here, the supplemental uh, book. Supplemental. Right. I can't read the notes and the words at the same time. I cannot. So what do you do? I just do the best I can. That's all you can do. That's all any of us can do, and that's the point that I'm trying to make. If our heart is where it's supposed to be then we do the best we can. That's all we can do. But, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit, I think sometimes we don't, we don't challenge ourselves to do. I mean, you know, I, have you all ever felt that way? I mean, just not about singing, but just about anything in general. I mean, there's lots of things that can be that way. We can basically be a little bit lazy. But I think what we've got to think about with regard to joy and the victory that we have through Christ to God is it's got to be reflected in the heart that we have for what we sing and how we sing. Uh, God is available to all of us and we've got to come to him with a joyful noise when we sing to him and reflect on our thankfulness for the blessings that he's given us. Here's what I want you to do. Grab a songbook. We're not going to sing songs. Uh, because what I do want to do, though, is get us to look at some of the songs that we do sing. And this is the regular bound book, and it's number 160. And Daryl, you sang this one Sunday morning, right? One day. And what I want us to do for just a minute, to get, a minute is to just look at these words. Because, again, when we do sing that tune so many times we know the song, it's easy to lose sight of what the words say, I'm afraid, if we're not careful. And so what I want us to do is just consider these words as we think about the song. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone was rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered, now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies will his glory, with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing, Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, a glorious day. That is some incredible words, powerful words to convey a message for us when we are singing that song about one day. So what do you get out of those words? Somebody tell me. What do you, what's that? Daryl says, I get chills up my back. That's a, good, that's a good way to feel. What else? What does that say to you? What do those words say to you? The gospel. The promise. Johnny said it's truthful. It is true what it is saying. What else? Hope. 
Good. What else? Majesty of God. What else? The love of God. Confession of faith? Absolutely. And when you think about all of those things and we listen to those words and we sing those words together and we are all individually doing the very best we can to worship God and we do that together, God's with us. What's that like for God? And what's that like for us? But again, we have got to be focused on what we are singing on the thoughts that the song is conveying, we've got to really be committed to that. You know, some of the thoughts that I put down there was Jesus left heaven uh, with God to walk on the earth and provide the example that we needed, that I had to have in, in his teaching while he was here. The suffering that he endured for the perfect sacrifice that I couldn't do for myself, that he had to do for me. I couldn't do it by myself. God had to do, I mean, had to do it for me through Jesus Christ. That his rec resurrection, like Johnny said, it's the truth, was the culmination of the plan of salvation as promised by God through the prophecy of the life of Christ. And when the day of judgment comes, then we're going to be glorified through him. That's just some of the thoughts that I had about, about that song. And again, I think sometimes we don't stop and think, and probably it'd be good if all of us had one of these books. You could probably take one home if you wanted to every once in a while or buy you one and take it home. Write down the songs that are sung at a service. Go back and take a look at those songs and think about the words. Think about the words that we're singing and think about what's being said. Okay, several points that I want to uh, specifically I think I'm having an equipment malfunction here. So here's some things I want us to think about. Uh, being able to have a thankful heart in the way that we sing. And these are some of the thoughts that I got from the lesson. Um, the fact that God is holy and how we should be aware of that in our, in our worship service when we're singing. Um, that when we sing, we should think about our proclamation of faith and our personal conviction we should think about the fact that God is with us we should think about the capability of us as song leaders because we've got a lot of different guys that lead singer song, lead songs and we as song leaders have to be capable and committed to the responsibility that we have and then ultimately what we all want to be able to do is have a true desire to worship and please God so, first of all, let's talk about right there, the first one. A thankful and a thankful heart that is true and we've got the right kind of attitude. First of all, God is holy. Um, and when we think of holiness and we think of what is ascribed to God as being holy, it sets him apart from us and everything else sets us apart from him and everything else holiness represents also the plan that he has for us as his people uh, when we sing to him it is a proclamation of our faith when we sing praise to God we are proclaiming our faith in him Psalm 71 8 says my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day when we sing, we should also sing with personal conviction. What does conviction mean? Dedication? What else does conviction mean? What does it mean? What else does it mean to you? You believe something. You believe something. And so the other thing that I would ask us to ask ourselves, and when we sing, do we sing like we believe it? Daryl's talking about getting cold chills when he sings a song. Do we sing like we believe it? You know, you might be running down the road and you got the radio on and you're listening to your favorite radio station. Or have you ever been at a stoplight or something and you see somebody next to you and they've got the radio blaring and they're, they're wailing it. <laughs> I mean, they're giving it all they've got. 
Or have you ever done that? Running down the road and you're singing a song and you're just, you're, <laughs> nobody hears you, but you're giving it all you got. So, you know, that's, that's the question. Do we sing these songs that we sing together at the worship service with conviction like we believe it? Like we believe it and understand uh, who and what God is and what he's done for us. Do we sing like we know God is with us? If we sing like we know God is with us, what does that sound like? The very best that we can do. I think that's what that sounds like. And that's what we've got to be committed to. God is with us. And we've got to do the best we can to please him. And the other thing that we should also remember is that it is this idea of ruah, um, joyful, and, and it's a celebration. It's a celebration of the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ and our relationship with God. Comments, anybody, on any of that? Okay. Go ahead, Bill. But one of my favorite songs is 124, and it can really touch my heart. Um, it's uh, What is it? Let's see. It, it'll bring tears to your eyes. Yeah, and there are other there are certain songs that have special meaning to us too. Nearer to nearer my God to thee. Yeah. So I mean, and there are different songs that have different impact on us for different reasons too. Right? Whether it's tied to a a special way that it touched us when we first heard it or sang it, or it might have been tied to an emotional thing where we may have lost a loved one and it was a song that was sung at a funeral or whatever it might be, there's always a reason that we might have uh, a certain song that does touch us, that touch us in a special way. Dwight, what'd you have? Did you say something? Well, I don't want to say anything wrong. No, it's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Number 683 is something that I get into. I, 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 everything else around me is void. Uh, Sing and be happy is the name of it. Right. And it says, if the skies above you are gray, you're feeling lonely and blue. Uh-huh. And all your cares have got you down. But the, the chorus is, takes up a whole page. Right. Sing and be happy. Sing right. and be happy. Right. And there are different parts in there, and it's beautiful. Right. It's and beautiful. we've got reasons to sing and be happy for all the things that we've been talking about. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Wait for the mic. Make him run. Come on, Matt. Hey, it's a jog. We got a jog going here to the middle of the auditorium. Um, when people make instruments, musical instruments, every musical instrument has a unique frequency of vibration. And so one of my mentors shared with me the idea that we make instruments to please us. And God has made an instrument that pleases him. And when you consider the many, many, many ways God works on our heart, yes, especially, and there's, here, one of my favorites is a prophecy from Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. It's a prophecy of the new covenant where it talks about how God is going to remove our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh and give us a new spirit, his spirit. And it's, um, you think about all the ways God works on us and trains us, but also works on us to help us have singing that's palatable to God and and it is true what the brother over there said some if our heart is what God hears when we sing that means even somebody who's tone deaf or even mute can sing in a way that's pleasing to God because he hears our hearts and I think that's a beautiful encouraging thing because we're never ever told even in that Psalm 100 we're never told to have a basis for our singing the quality of how we sound to people. That's not the basis of our singing. It's because God is so amazing. And so we should sing, even if we are mute or even if we are tone deaf, and people may judge us in that way. But I just think it's an amazing thing that God, the same God who says we don't know how to pray in Romans 8, will take our heart and he judges our heart 
And it's also another reason we need to check ourselves and make sure our heart is pure. But I just think it's amazing um, that he has prepared our heart to be the instrument of his choice that is pleasing to his ear. Thank you. Yeah, Matt, over to Matt. Great thought. Yeah, it is about the heart, and certainly we want to do the best we can, but God knows our heart, and he knows if we're doing the best we can, whatever that is too. Matt? If you reverse engineer this psalm, you start at the, at the end. If you know that the Lord is good and his love endures forever, then you know the Lord is God in verse 3. And so that allows you and creates the stimulus for you to shout for joy, for you to worship the Lord in gladness. It's the catalyst that causes you to be joyful and to sing these songs. Yeah. Thank you. The next thing I want to talk about in just a minute is um, encouragement. So I think this is an important part of our song worship service too. And one of the points that was made in the book was regarding uh, Paul and Silas. Now if you want to take your Bibles and turn over to Acts, the 16th chapter. And, you know, what was going on with those guys? I mean, they were, they were doing what they were supposed to do. And so what happens in verse 22, the multitude rose up together against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them in prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosened. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his household, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all of his family were baptized. And when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all of his household. So we've got Paul and Silas. They are in prison for doing the Lord's work. And what happens? They get in there and they do what they do. They pray and they sing. What happens as a result of them doing that? What happens? Well, there's a miracle. But, well, yeah, so I think the first thing that I got out of that was I believe Paul encouraged Silas and Silas encouraged Paul. If you're both doing that work together and you're in prison for doing what you had been charged to do and if I'm singing and you're singing and we're singing together, I've been beaten within an inch of my life and stripped of my clothes and I'm in shackles and I'm in the inner prison and that wasn't a great place to be. That's one thing that we had that nobody could take away from us is praising God. And that's what they did. Who else did they encourage? Others, the jailer, right? So those things happened. And when they started doing those things, what was the other thing that happened? What's that? But before that, an earthquake, of some kind of disturbance in the, in the ground so that they're... Their chains came off of them, and they didn't leave. Um, and they had that opportunity that they had with the jailer. So a lot of good things happened there. Doesn't matter where we are, what our circumstances are, what's going on. God wants, God demands, God expects praise and worship, and we give it to him, but we also benefit from it as well. Uh, I think also, I just believe that those guys sang with conviction. I can't help but believe that they sang with conviction in their heart. Uh, Matt, over here, Mike's got one. They sang with conviction in their heart when they were in prison to let everyone know that apart from why they were jailed, they were still ready to do what 
God expected of them. We just got to keep in mind why we sing. We sing to teach and admonish one another. Now, do we teach with a tune or do we teach with the words? So, I'm not a songwriter, but I would think probably the person that have written the songs have came up with the words for us. So when we're looking at the words, we've got to believe what those words say and what the message those words are saying, and that's pleasing to God. And then adding the tune to it is just another way of teaching. It's a way to be able to keep us all together. Uh, it's a way to be able to have, and songs are written. And again, I mean, I'm not a songwriter. I mean, I'm, I do the best I can with song leading. Uh, and I got a couple of comments over here, Matt. But okay, talk loud. Mike. And with teaching, thing with, sing with thanksgiving, understanding, and teaching. Yeah, absolutely, agree with all that. And uh, Jim, did you have something too? In, in James chapter one, I like when it talks about. But let, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Well, it's the same thing with our singing. Why sit here and try to sound pretty if it means nothing? You know, right. when, you, when you pray, when you pray, let him ask in faith, expecting. You know, when we sing, that's that conviction you was talking about. Right. You got to have that conviction, right. I think, or, or you better be a real good singer because it's not going to make much difference. Right, <laughs> right. Well, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with us sounding good. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with us all being on the same note. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with us, uh, you know, having the pitch right and having the tempo because the song's written a certain way by that writer because of what you guys just said. There's a message there that they're trying to convey. And if the song leader, and I'm going to get into that in a few minutes, is doing the best he can to accomplish what the writer of the song has written, then we're going to do the best we can, collectively and individually, in trying to worship God in a way that he's going to be pleased. Now, again, we've all got to look at ourselves individually. But I'm just saying... It doesn't matter what the responsibility that is that you have in, before the worship service. We've all got to be on the same page. Uh, and, and whoever's responsible for leading the service has got to do their job in, in leading the service. Dale? One thing I've noticed, uh, it was around midnight, and you think the other prisoners would be telling them to shut up, but it says the prisoners were listening. I want to know more. There's a lot of stuff in the scriptures. One thing that impresses me about the Bible, if man had written all of this and he made it up, this book would be volumes and volumes and volumes. You know, so, so much said here. Uh, the jailer's baptized. I wonder if he went back and talked with these prisoners. And just, we don't know what all may right. have happened after all of that. Right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot there. But again, I mean, just the encouragement that happened in that situation was something that kind of made a point to me. There's another song. Uh, and we've just got a few minutes, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at that one. Well, just write that one down and go back and look at it yourself. It's a really cool song. We, I've sang it a few times here before, but the reason it sticks out to me is because of the brother that I remembered hearing it the first time I ever sang it. And write that number down, 582, it pays to serve Jesus. Uh, and, and if you'll check that out, you'll see that it's got a lot of really important things that we need to be thinking about with regard to uh, praising God and, and glorifying Him and celebrating what He has done for us. There are a few things that, that I do want to get to before we uh, get finished up, though. Personal commitment. So again, this is just individual questions that I can't answer. We all have to kind of answer for ourselves, and nobody can answer it but you. Do the best you can, and we've said that already. Uh, what do we expect from ourselves? What does God expect from us? He expects our best. How do we get better? How do you get better at anything you want to get better at? You practice, right? Back here, Matt, Keith's got something. How do you get better at anything you do? You practice, 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 practice. There's so much power and emotion in a song, and when a song is written co correctly, I think it puts a melody to the word of God 
And like you said, these songs take us back possibly to someone in her family that's passed away and something that was important to them. Uh, my dad had a favorite song, uh, This World Is Not My Home, and this, was, this song meant more to him the closer he got sure. to death, and he knew that there was no hope here on earth. Right. And now when I hear that song, it brings that emotion to me also. But uh, when a song's done correctly, and there's specific songs for specific times in worship. Right. And we, need, we do need to be careful and, and make sure that we're putting those specific songs where they should be in right. worship. Absolutely. So song leaders have a big responsibility, and that was part of what I was going to talk about next. But again, we've all got to work at it. If I'm a song leader, I've certainly got to work at it. But even if we're out here, we've got to, we've got to make sure that our heart is motivated to do the best we can with the songs that we sing. So, song leaders. Sure. Okay. Uh huh. singing there right. is, it's acapella there's no no instruments right you talk about cold chills going up down your back but Darryl talk, was talking about it I'm on, i've been there i know what but that's practice about. he's talking about These barbershop music quartet majors. the time that people put into getting better about being able to do that and be effective but it's true anything that you're really committed to people are willing to invest the time to be able to try and do better so you know how important is what the song leader does in the service? Keith, that's what we're talking about is, you know, you got to pick the right songs for the right part of the service, for the right time in the service, for the Lord's Supper, for the invitation, what it might be. Is there anything wrong with a song leader understanding and trying to be good at the mechanics of singing a song? No, I don't think so. Because if you don't try and do that, and you got 300 people trying to sing together, that, that can be a mess. <laughs> if you don't understand the tempo, if you're not trying to keep the time of the song, if you're not trying to do those things that are pleasing to God in the way that the song is written and lead everybody that way, uh, then we can, we can not please God. So it's a big responsibility that anybody is entrusted with, and we've got to do the very best that we can. And the song service is an important part of the overall worship service. The song service can set the tone for the entire worship service. The praying is important, the reading is important, the sermon is important, but the song service can be the thread that ties everything together with regard to our, our state of mind and really being committed to what it is that we need to be thinking about with regard to our worship. So anyway... Uh, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's look at the questions real quick. There's a few more things that I wanted to say, but let's just go on and take a look at the questions, if you will, in the book, and I'll get some responses from that. First question is, in your own words, what does it mean to make a joyful noise to the Lord? What does it mean? Come on. Sing in spirit and truth. How about, or excuse me, how and why should we sing to God when our hearts are sad? Why is it important to do when our hearts are sad? Pick me up, Dwight said. Because God says to, John said. It's an encouragement to me if I don't feel good and I need to be encouraged. What types of understanding are necessary for excellence in song worship? Understand the text of the song and the intent of what the writer's written. What else? Say it again. Understand who you are singing to. And understand who you're, you're singing with. So we're to encourage each other. We're to sing to God. We're to understand the words. We're to really work on expressing our gratitude and our appreciation for what God has done for us, and it's a way to glorify Him. And I don't know about you, but sometimes if I have to really, I have to zero in on what I'm doing and make sure that I don't let things from the world get in my way of doing that. And if, it, if we're not careful, that can happen. 
Thanks, everybody, for your comments and uh, participation. will be on Lesson 1.7 on Sunday morning with Travis, The Promise of His Coming.